Imagine a ceiling painting twice the size of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel frescoes, filled with swirls of color and shapes, textures and illusions. This masterpiece was created for the University of Houston's Moore School of Music by the great American artist Frank Stella. The work decorates the entrance wall and ceiling and includes an enormous dramatic painted ellipse, which is suspended in the Moore's Opera House. To accomplish this feat, Stella had to create the images and assemble the team to put them on canvas. The team came together in early 1997 when Stella, his principal assistant Earl Childress, and collaborators Tamson Plant and Cindy Scaife led dozens of artists, Houston's mayor and many children, in painting canvases stretched across high walls of a large warehouse in downtown Houston. These expansive paintings cover 5,000 square feet and took nine months, many thousands of working hours, and tremendous teamwork to complete. How are great paintings of such vast dimensions created? Well, when the project began, we all knew that it was going to take more than one person to complete it. We all knew that lots of people would have to be involved in the construction of this major work. But I don't think anybody anticipated, and certainly I didn't, the extent to which everyone would become involved and really be kind of swept up in this project and take a sense of ownership and pride. Once artists got involved in creating works on an architectural scale, um, they needed to take a different approach to their creation. And there's a really interesting tradition of a sort of studio approach to the creation of public art. It's one that maybe isn't as visible and people are less aware of. People are always thinking about the hand of the artist and um, that you know, in intrinsic creativity. But in essence, every large-scale work of art that is created um, is usually being done in a sort of collaborative manner. It's a little shrink, too. Yeah, because so. we have to prime it, so it's just going to... It's going to shrink, it's going to shrink, you know, and then it around afterwards, too. We'll have to do the same as last time, just readjust the staples every, after every time. Okay. Are we in that around? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the teamwork is pretty well set. I mean, uh, it was set since what happened in Toronto, I mean, for these public painting projects. I mean, I work on the idea, I work with Earl on it, and we, we come up with a collage, and then he has an idea of, of what it's going to be, and we know, and we take it then basically to Tamsin and Cindy, who are responsible uh, for getting it organized in the sense of getting the, uh, you know, getting the people ready to set up the painting, the painting detail. It's a big honor. It's, it's something that, you know, you couldn't really imagine um, to work with the artists that um, at least I was enamored with, you know, in uh, the first art history class I took. This is an incredibly large project, and I've been very impressed with the way that Cindy and Tamsin have organized it and always have something for everybody to do and really have kept this project moving at a very quick pace. You know, after working on it, you get a, a huger appreciation of his work. And with all the people working on it and everything, you think, it's amazing after you look at it. So why don't you take half of the mixture and add uh, yeah, some? Yeah. yeah. So thin it out and then it just looks like it's drying really intense. The tone is probably right, but it's just drying a little too saturated. Just a sip. She said light. And you want to try the light, the light, the yeah. first version on this. Yeah. Okay. You know, that's going to be different from what okay. the Okay. All right, but I, whatever we do, we have to do to both these things. So, um, I think so we have to change the whole thing. So you want me to spray that now? Yeah. Well, just eyeball it. Did everyone hear that? It's only
hope that in the working process, things change and they get a little freer and things happen. It's a little hard to dictate that. And there's also a very fine line between if you tell them they're really loose, that they can do whatever they want, then they, you know, then they really get to their own ideas and they make a mess. If I make a mistake, generally I can convince myself that uh, I, it's really better that way. <laughs> and if I do it here, I can't, I can't do it because it's Frank Stella's work. You know, it's hard for me to make it uh, a correction. You know, uh, it's a big deal, my opinion. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, a lot of times I say, gee, that's okay. You know, you think I said they were the greatest artist, you know, since Michelangelo. All I said was it was okay. I mean, but it goes both ways. I don't like the part of, uh, you know, being the slave driver and stuff. It's a little hard. It works better if I don't like something if Earl tells them. You know, it's not so heavy. If I, if I honestly thought that, you know, I was going to teach somebody how to do something each time I met somebody, it may get a little daunting. But, you know, we, we tend to, to teach by example, and the projects are inspiring enough, so, you know, we don't have to light a fire for people all the time. If Frank Stella was to only paint the works himself, uh, we would have very little Frank Stella to see. As he's moved through his career, he has been a signal influence time and again to artists both younger um, than he and um, working in other directions. When he started literally breaking apart the painting surface, he started using honeycomb aluminum and other so-called non-fine art materials, more industrial materials, and the paintings literally began to erupt from the wall. When you look at the three-dimensional collages, for instance, that first make up uh, his initial ideas, and many of these are uh, these kind of recycled bits of earlier investigations that he's been involved in, then those get translated through the computer into pixel paintings, and it's a very interesting uh, relationship where the very flat two-dimensional pixel painting entirely replicates the look of the three-dimensional relief surface, and you have this beautiful trompe l'oeil effect where uh, you can't really tell until you go up close to it that it's a two-dimensional version of the three-dimensional relief. And the translation from the pixel painting into a kind of hand-painted collage where each area is broken down into a discrete unit of, of, a, of a particular style of painting or a particular um, investigatory uh, area for Stella, the stripes or the cigar smoke or whatever it be. And then that final translation from that collage, uh, hand-painted collage, into the painted surface of either a sculptural form, as in Severinda, the large-scale piece, or into an architectural space, like the, vaults, the vaulted ceiling in the Moore School project. But when I print them out, most of the material that I have, in the printing scale, which is on a large piece of paper, say something like this, on that, that scale, that, that's it. I can handle that. We cut that out. I cut it out. I handle it, and I work with it, and I know it, it works. I fit it together in the collages, and the ideas are there for me. I, I see it happen. I make lots of changes. I mean, the, uh, the collages are actually, you know, I mean, they could be a couple of inches thick. I mean, there's infinite amounts of layers, actually. I change my mind a lot of time. Wait, actually, sometimes, uh, when I don't have enough material in the studio or I'm sort of desperate to, to do something and I feel stuck, I actually steal from the collages without changing them by just slipping uh, some of the material out from behind them. There's so much buried underneath them that there are a lot of ideas that uh, you know, got buried or got pasted over that I sometimes resuscitate. So the question of scale becomes uh, you know, uh, a question of how much bigger does that get? To be a painting, it usually gets doubled, and that makes a pretty good normal kind of pictorial impact, or that's a normal painting for me, I guess. I don't know. We double it uh, from what the size that I'm working, from the collage scale to the painting scale, 
and then I guess you'd call the next step the mural scale. That's what I've gotten from this is the scale. You know, getting, because I've done work, you know, doing interior paintings before, but this is so big, so big. It's actually larger than, let's say, the Sistine Chapel by quite, you know, it's twice mm -hmm. as big as the Sistine Chapel. And it's, um, it's the work of 12 people, at least 12 people working constantly 40 hours a week. And I mean, it could never be, I mean, it's, it could, it's the most labor intensive thing I've ever seen. It's not yours, so it's, it's really interesting to put so much energy into something that is, belongs to somebody else, but it, it, it is, you do have a part in it, which is really interesting. I think it could be very helpful in one's own work. I finally came to the realization the other day that with this vault over here that, that we have built, rather than working on a flat canvas, we work on the actual structure that it's going on. And Susanna and I were working on one element where we had to get a curve right, and when Tamsin was explaining it to us, I think, just it, she was saying about getting the flow right, because if you don't get the flow right and the curve right, it kind of loses the point of the element because it's an integral part of the building and the structure. I hadn't really thought of that before, like where exactly it was going to be placed and the fact that these elements are purposely placed to add to the flow of the building and the flow of the interior, yeah. One of the things that's particularly difficult is um, we're working off of a collage that Frank Stella has made. Um, and many of the elements, many of the bits of paper are computer generated or computer manipulated. And um, it might be smoke rings that have been computer manipulated to distort them a little bit each time that they repeat. Um, and so every time that we go to one of those elements and then we have to translate it, you know, a hundred <laughs> times bigger, but just as exactly, um, I think that that's probably one of the most challenging and, and difficult things to do. This architecture was tough. I mean, you have to, as they say, call a spade a spade. Uh, this is a big, you know, sort of 50s type building with, uh, you know, a kind of archway with, a, uh, you know, with a, another arch cutting through it. And it's, uh, it's you know, it, it was tough geometry there. But these are big public uh, decorative art projects that I try as hard as I can to put as much art in it as possible. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's not that easy to put the art in public art. And uh, I work as hard at it as anybody does and has, and I d don't make any claim to have been more successful than anybody else. As you or anyone else enters this building, you're surrounded by Frank Stella's work of art, and that's a wonder. Uh, because of the scale, because of the enormity of this project, one walking into this building might not know a lot about the process that went into its creation, but I think even experiencing it after the fact, one will have a sense of the fact that this is an artwork for the ages. In both the, the instance in Toronto and, and the, the, the job here, the, the unseen team member has always has been the patron. In this instance, Beth Morian and, and her group um, were, was kind of our, our extra team member. Yeah, the, the University of Houston, I am proud to say, has always put a small portion of its budget aside to produce a work of art. Uh, this type of art, uh, the massiveness of it, the hugeness of it, the international artist uh, part of it was a little bit over our 1% budget. And so when we thought about, well, should we do it or should we not, I just said we had to do it. It was something that the Houston needed and certainly the University of Houston needed. What did we want this art to do, the art itself? 
And so we had a meeting with a number of people, including Beth Morian and myself and, uh, and some officials at the university. And we said we wanted this to be full of life, joy, uh, that it w should be exuberant, uh, that it should be optimistic. And those are the things that, that we said we wanted in the art. I don't know how that translates into abstract art, but he certainly uh, has designed something which, which is colorful and brilliant and ebullient and lively. You want a reaction. You want people to have, you know, to feel something about the effort. And in this case, and in this building, I would say that the primary image or the primary feeling that, that almost everyone uh, would uh, say that they, that they expect or were hoping for would be to give a lift, you know, to give the building, a, to get the building off the ground a little bit, to get the sense of going into the theater, to have some of the excitement, some of the excitement of the theatrical experience in the, in the, in the preliminary visual experience of the building in the entrance of the building. I mean, it's a, it is an entryway after all, and we want, what you want is a, a kind of exciting entrance. And I think that we were very successful with the gesture. The running and sweeping and swirling along on the ceiling, I think is kind of nice, and it's not exactly expected overhead. The normal thing that happens in the ceilings is that they open up, and you have the sense of airiness and the moving, moving-ness of the clouds and the, uh, whatever happens in the heavens. In here, you have a very kind of abstract, Thing and you have a, uh, you know, you have this sense of uh, basically grids and graphs, but they're moving. They seem to spin along, and uh, with the sort of uh, uh, patches and splotches of color. So I think it moves pretty well. It's just as lyrical and special, and uh, a special focal point for this place. In fact, it's really a focal point for the university in that this is one of our main entrances and, and you instantly talk about setting the tone and setting such a happy, special tone. Uh, I, I couldn't be more pleased. Well, I think the, the, the thing that we're going to remember is the, um, the way we worked with the community here, the, the community at large. I, you know, like I said, I, Beth and I met half of the city of Houston trying to raise money for the project. And then after we started working on the project, I met the other half of the city when all of the kids came by the studio to, to help, you know, or help or actually view the work in progress. project just making for a, a wonderful stepping stone uh, for our growth as an artist and I think a lot of us are going to be taking what we've learned here and some new techniques and new experiences and we will be applying them I, there's no doubt about it bits that I've worked on are you know very important to me and, I, and you know when I when I go into the building and I have my grandchildren with me, I'm going to tell them about it, and I'm going to tell them how long I worked on that one curve that had to follow the flow. You know how many times she yelled at me? The thing that I will take away from this job is just the sense of community that I've uh, felt from, from our studio and then also outside of the studio with Houston itself and the U of H everyone kind of working together with a common goal and everyone trying to help each other out as well. I mean, this is going to be a masterpiece and it's all because everybody gets along so well. And that, that's the main reason why. It's not, 
It's not because of what Frank has done. It's not because of what Earl has done or Cindy and I. It's because of what everybody's done together. That's it. And I think that that, uh, that experience of working with a master artist at his prime on a very major project will be with them forever and will certainly affect many careers to come. This triptych really turned out to be quite incredible. And, you know, I think it's wonderful because people are going to have an opportunity to go up to it very closely. My first response in walking into the lobby was, gee, I'd love to go up and, and see how they actually did that. And so to have that opportunity here on this level, I think is something people will really enjoy. Being able to figure out a little bit about how they approached layering it and the different passages of painting. I mean, it's so complex. I mean, it's so much about collage as well as about painting that I think it'll be really wonderful for people to have that experience to it. I mean, look at that passage. I mean, that's amazing at where it all comes together there. All these different styles and all these different layers. I mean, you could spend an awful lot of time uh, losing yourself in this. I also think it's interesting that that the architect chose to have the light fixtures designed by an artist as well, because obviously light is going to be critical to the overall interpretation of the whole space. You know, the nature of these um, public projects, or, or let's call them group projects, um, the thing that, that, that I am hoping that people will see is the, not really the, the sum total of all of our energy, but the fact that we all worked very hard on the project, and that, you know, there, were, there were at least 60 different people that have worked on the project, but the, pro, you know, the, the, the individual efforts combined with the dynamic of the project, I hope, you know, makes a little bit of magic, and I hope that, that that's the part that's, that's present. Really, truly gorgeous, and I love looking up at it. It's so different, it's not the usual run of the art, you know, that you would expect, or think you would expect, but it's so electrifying too, you know, it just picks you up when you first come in, and I just love the whole thing, it's gorgeous, Great. it's gorgeous. The city of Houston is so lucky to have something so beautiful. Well, I have to say, walking into this building and looking up, it's electrifying to see the the Stella installation. Uh, one of the wonderful things is that this is a permanent installation in Houston and we rarely see those and when we do it's a real day to truly celebrate. The building is just fabulous. The art is spectacular. Um, I've never been in a building more beautiful. It is just wonderful. The public things are challenging in a way but I mean it's they're not uh, you know maybe I'm not doing it well enough or something. I find them a little bit uh, um, unsatisfying in some ways too. You spend an awful lot of time uh, relating to other people, you know, and I think the people that become artists became artists in the first place because they weren't that <laughs> great at relating to other people. <laughs> yeah, it makes me pretty happy to go back to the studio and just work on a little painting. <laughs> I used to think it was kind of boring and not that interesting, and now I'm quite happy to be left alone and work by myself. Yeah, let me give another analogy uh, in terms of uh, the production of great art. Uh, the, the kind of important music that's produced in Hollywood, and I happen to think that some of America's greatest music has been produced for movies. Uh, John Williams uh, does not orchestrate his music. Did you know that? Did you know that none of the Hollywood composers do? Because the way a movie is produced, they produce the entire movie without any music, and then the final thing is given to the composer, and they say to him, here's the movie, you've got a month to produce this, and they may have to produce a soundtrack that's 97 minutes long. Well, physically, it's impossible for someone to write that much music and orchestrate it, and then produce all the parts. So if it's a John Williams or a, uh, any of the fine composers, they sketch out and they put down, maybe they put down, put some of this in the strings, put some of this, and then they have orchestrators who do the orchestration. They have copyists who do the copyists. They have, they have many people, and of course, they 
The composer, John Williams, will keep oversight of the entire project to make sure it all goes. But, uh, and in the same way that Frank Stella has produced this art, has conceived of it, it's his conception, it's his design, and he will be participating in the production of it uh, in the same way that John Williams produces his music for Hollywood.